All right, let's go to work in this little book. It is only 38 verses. Maybe the smallest book in the Old Testament. There are a couple in the New that are close. First, second, and third John sort of are even shorter than this. But Haggai is only two chapters and 38 verses. One of the shortest in the Old Testament. Haggai is the prophet. Uh, I'm not sure what the name means. It might mean something like to be festive, or it could mean Old Testament festival or festival sacrifice. Really not clear what his name actually means. More important than that is the timeline. Let's get the timeline. It's good for us to have that. I like to operate on a timeline. It helps me think about history. So if you look at it, we've sort of been doing it like this, that in 586, that was the fall of Judah. It's the fall of the southern kingdom. Now Israel and Judah are wiped out. So the fall of Judah to the Babylonians in 586. So you put that on one end. And then after that, in about 538, then you have the rise of Cyrus. He's a Persian. So 538, Cyrus lets Israel go home. Exile is over. 586, they're going to exile. About 538, it's over. And then 520, so 18 or 20 years after they're, everybody's home, 520 is when Haggai is preaching. So he's preaching at the end of really the timeline on the Old Testament. He's preaching to a group of people that have gone through the exile. They've suffered under the Babylonians. They spent time under the Persians. Now they are free. They, they came back to Jerusalem, maybe 50,000 people walked several hundred miles to get back. So that's the intro, and there's the timeline. And the author will just, just put Haggai as his name. There's not really anything else to know about him. When you read it, there's nothing that... We don't find out anything reading Haggai. There's no real autobiographical information. All of those things really lead us to the setting. <clears throat> What's most important about Haggai is to know the setting. Why is it here? You find it right there in Haggai chapter 1, verse 1, in the intro. You <clears throat> have to pay attention to it. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai to the prophet, Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltael, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So the word came to Haggai, the prophet. All right, we have the setting, verse 1, and it's very clear. Verse 1 of chapter 1 is a time stamp. So anytime you got a time stamp, you have what the Bible says, and then you can go back in history and, and couple that up and find out exactly when that is. So we know from chapter 1, verse 1, 520 is the year. Now, think about the, the setting. <clears throat> so the Assyrians, the Assyrians took Israel away, 722 or so. The Assyrians, they came, took is Israel, and really just wiped out the northern, just dispersed them. They're just gone. You have Judah left. They hung on for a little while longer to 586. It wasn't the Assyrians. It was the Babylonians that got Judah. So the Assyrians took Israel. The Babylonians get Judah. Babylonians as a kingdom, so they're doing pretty good. Uh, we're on the back end of their kingdom. The Persians come in. The Persians last a long time. Man, I'm reading a history right now. And uh, the, uh, the history of uh, the, the Byzantine Empire. It's taking me forever to get through the book. It's halfway interesting and halfway tedious. So like almost every night I read it, and I think, ah, I'm so tired of this book. But uh, it's pretty interesting, so keep reading. So you, I'm reading about the Persians that are, that are a thousand years later than right here. The Persians came and defeated the Babylonians. And the Persians are the one that said, we don't want the Jews here, send them home. So they sent the Jews home, and they sent them home with money in their pockets and told them to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So, Babylonians defeated by the Persians, 539 Cyrus, 
the Persian. He let them return. They started building the temple. You can read about that in Ezra chapter 1 and 2. So we have that whole story over in Ezra. Remember, Ezra was building the temple, and then you have the story of Nehemiah rebuilding the walls. So all of that is happening before Haggai. All of that is going on. When you read Ezra 1 and 2, they start real good building the temple. I mean, everybody's gung-ho. Let's get after it. After a little while, when you're reading Ezra 1 and 2, the momentum starts to slow down. They face opposition. We read some of that in Nehemiah, Sanballat, and Tobiah, uh, the great discouragers. Same thing's going on in the building of the temple. The people around there don't want them doing it. And finally, enough discouragement sets in when you read Ezra 1 and 2 that the temple is left half done. And it sits like that for a long time. Anybody here ever been to Natchez, Mississippi? Do you all know Natchez, Mississippi? So if you think back with me on the Civil War, it breaks out. It's a terrible thing all the way across from the Mississippi all the way here to the East Coast. And uh, the story of Fredericksburg, the terrible story, but on the same day that Fredericksburg, uh, the Get- I'm sorry, that Gettysburg happens, the same day you've got Vicksburg in Mississippi on the river, Mississippi River, it falls. And the people in Vicksburg, Mississippi, wouldn't celebrate, uh, the, wouldn't celebrate the 4th of July for almost 100 years. They were so mad still. And that's a long time to hold a grudge. You come down the river a little bit, you'll find a little town called Natchez, Mississippi. Natchez, Mississippi is where all the cotton was. They had the land barons and the cotton barons in Natchez. And a whole lot of their mansions on the river survived the war. You can go there and tour them. It's, it's really unbelievable. And there's one, uh, there's one mansion on the river named Longwood. You ought to look it up. you probably find a YouTube on it. Longwood started, the construction on that mansion started in 1860. Well, 1861, the war is raging. And construction got about halfway done. After the war, that part of the South is decimate, decimated. Nobody went back to building that house. So if you go to Longwood now, if you go there, you'll see a, a house that is halfway done. Now, for years, it just sat vacant. It uh, sat halfway built, and that's sort of how the temple was. You probably have ridden by houses that construction started in 07, the economy tanked 08 and 09, and they sat there for a long time not being worked on. That's what's happening here. And when things sit for that long, it's hard to get the ball rolling again. The work was dormant for probably 20 years or so, about 20 years or so. So Haggai, Haggai preached in an effort to get it started again. His whole, his whole reason for being there was to get them to start building the temple again. So this is what he's up against. The, the uh, word is inertia. Do you understand inertia? That bodies in motion tend to stay in motion. And you know the other part? And bodies at rest stay at rest. And when one's at rest, it's hard to get it going again. If you ever have been on an exercise regime and you got on it and you worked out hard, you stayed with it, and then you fell off the wagon, you quit working out for a little while, and you let it go for months at a time, and then you decide, I'm going to start working out again. It is really hard to get that thing moving again. You're sore for weeks on end. You're not as strong as you used to be. You can't run like you did. It's hard to get it going. Haggai is approaching this group of people that have been dormant for almost 18 years, and he's trying to get them to go back to work. That's his whole That's his whole impetus for even existing. Now, all that I've told you just now, that's the backdrop and the setting for the outline. Let's give uh, three three or four points. We need restoration. Let's start there with the outline. Let's start with restoration. Restoration. Why do they need restoration? Because a decaying temple signifies a decaying relationship to the Lord. Weakness rather than holiness. Let me read that to you in chapter 2, verse 14. 
chapter 2, verse 14. Haggai answered and said, So is it with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands, and they offer, and what they offer is unclean. As the temple is, so the people are. And the idea was, the temple is where God will meet with His people. Now, thankfully for us, as Christians, we don't have to go to a place to actually meet personally with God. We gather together on the, with the church. The church is not the building. The church is the people. Right? The church is where the Spirit of God dwells because the people have gathered together. Not only that, if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit is in you. You already are a temple unto God. That wasn't the case with the Old Testament. For them to build the temple would be where God would meet with them. And the understanding to have restoration, in order for God to meet with His people, we need this building built. So, restoration. A decaying temple signified a decaying relationship to the Lord. They didn't care. Let me give you something else about this. When you read Haggai, you're going to see the, uh, you're going to see the power of God's Word. The power of God's Word. You see that in chapter... I'll just read you a couple of them. Chapter 1, verse 1 and verse... Let's go to verse 3. We already read verse 1. The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Chapter 2, verse 1. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Down in verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month, on the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. God spoke through a man to his people. Now, thankfully... We don't claim that God is speaking by direct revelation through a person anymore. We've got God's Word. So if someone stands up and says to you, God has told me to tell you, it needs to be exactly what the Bible says. They need to be reading the Bible out loud. If that's how we hear God speak, how? We hear God speak when somebody reads the Bible out loud. But the power of God's Word with Haggai, was given, and God used that to motivate His people, to get them moving in the right direction. So when you read Haggai, it's just 38 verses, but you see the power of God's Word. What else do we learn? Maybe one of my favorite themes in the whole Bible, there's a third part of this uh, outline, <clears throat> and that is that the, that the Lord is sovereign. Sovereign. One of the things I've tried to teach our church over the last almost 15 years has been the, the intricate and clear and direct sovereignty of God. And when I say that, I don't mean like we all agree that God's in control or He knows everything. So, so it's not much comfort to say that God knows. And we also would even say, okay, yes, God is in control. But sometimes it's like we... We think he has sat back and is watching, and if things get out of line, it reaches just to adjust. When I say sovereignty, I mean that God is actively, genuinely in control of everything that is going on. He is working out his purposes in creation through every single thing. That, that's what Paul teaches in the book of Romans. So when I use that phrase... Um, a couple of reasons why. When you read the book of Haggai, what you find is this little book, 38 verses, 14 times you have the phrase, the Lord of hosts. 14 times. And this one little two-chapter book is God described as the Lord of hosts. That word, Yahweh Sabaoth, it means the God who has armies and he rules them. Uh, for instance, uh, chapter 1, Verse 2, <clears throat> thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. So that's just one example of the Lord of hosts. So when I say sovereignty, what do I mean? Let me give you a couple of uh, descriptors of sovereignty. By the way, I've been working on Colossians, preaching Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. You guys pray for me as you think of it this Sunday. You know, when you're preaching Mark, you have a narrative. You have a storyline. You can go through, point out things. It's, you can hang a, a hook on some of the story. 
when you're preaching an epistle like this, a pastoral epistle or a prison epistle, it's really, it's, it's words and information and sentence structures. So I'm working on an outline, and it's way too long right now. It's way too long. I must have 15 points right now. So i got to pare it all down. Okay, yeah, yeah. I wish we did have the time. i got to pare it all down. Uh, would you pray that, it, anyway, we would accurately uh, give it to you on Sunday? Let me give you just a couple of things uh, about God's sovereignty. One is the Lord gives... The Lord gives the word. He gives us his word. Chapter 1, verse 9. You looked for much, and behold, when it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. The Lord gives us. He speaks. Like, we don't have to wonder. Our God is not silent. The Lord is sovereign. Okay, let me give you another descriptor. Uh, God controls the future of his people. God controls the future of his people. If you're a young person, you wonder what, lays, what is ahead of me, what's going, what, what do you worry about, what's down the road. Here's something to just kind of rest your head on. He, he controls the future of his people. Chapter 2, verse 17. Let me read it to you. It's not really a pleasant thing, this one, but the Lord says, I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. I did this to you. He controls the future. Look, he, let's, let's open it up even further. We're going to pray about uh, the election coming up on Sunday night. Uh, there's a lot at stake. The election, I've already voted, did the vote, uh, early voting. But it's good for us to remember, he even controls the nations, which I'm very thankful for. Chapter 2, verse 6, 7, and 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. I'll fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. What a beautiful verse. Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. In fact, 20 years ago... Uh, when I went to Dolphin Way Baptist Church in Mobile, I left Hickory Grove to go there. Like my home church, my mom and dad are here. When I left here, I, it was brokenhearted and went to Dolphin Way, which was a church that, that had completely collapsed in on itself. Like a church sanctuary, the size of our sanctuary here, uh, but there was not another employee at the church. I was, I was the paid employee. We had... Uh, Retired ladies, or two retired ladies, they were serving as a receptionist answering the phone. There were some days the phone rang, I had to go up and answer the phone. Anyway, the, the dirt, it was not good. And I, I remember taking this passage and, and praying that God would do that. And the Lord was kind and restored the church. Uh, in fact, uh, the very first Sunday I went was the 100th celebration of Dolphin Way's existence. 2004. The governor of Alabama was there. Uh, and he stood up and told everybody he had shoes that were older than me. I bet he doesn't anymore, but then he did. And now, 20 years later, their 120th anniversary is coming up next in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to be there. Uh, and I thought, man, I wonder if I should preach this passage. I just thought of it right now. I wonder if I should preach Haggai. So y'all pray for me on, on that regard. But this is a reminder that he controls all things. He controls the nations. Hey, look, Here's another thing. He directs nature. This is good to remember. With all this happening in Western North Carolina, chapter 1, verse 10, what does the Lord say? Therefore the heavens above, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. The Lord did that. He directs nature. When I talk about sovereignty, I mean that, um, here's another one. 
he moves his people into action. Like he does things to motivate us. Remember the context? The people that not built the temple, they quit doing it. And God presses us. Let me show you where I get that. Chapter 1, verse 14. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltael, who is governor of Judah. So, so God working with the governor. And the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, who was the high priest. And the spirit of all the remnant people, the 50,000 people that had come home, but they weren't building the temple. They came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts their God. So he actually moves them. It's good for us to remember that, that it's God that does the work. We are faithful. We do what God has commanded us, but we trust that the Spirit of God, when we think about evangelism, when you share the gospel, it's not going to be dependent on your ability to get it right. You need to get it right. You need to be able to talk about the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, what it takes to be saved, but God is the one who saves. In fact, when I'm working through Colossians, one of the things that Paul is, is teaching the people how to be thankful, he is thanking God for faith. Like even the ability to believe is a, is a gift from God. So he moves his people into action. One more thing about the sovereignty of God in this passage. God establishes kingdoms, and God removes kingdoms. That's something to remember. I'm reading, told you about that book. It's called The New Roman Empire, if you get interested. I mean, it's really boring. The information's good. It's just a boring read. So the, the uh, New Roman Empire is settled by Constantine, creates Constantinople. It's in the 4th century. That's where Rome moves to the east. Rome in the west is conquered by the Germanic tribes. They're overrun and uh, never really emerges again. But this new Roman Empire in the east, where Orthodox Christianity is, for another 1,000, 1,100 years, it rains. It's un I mean, the walls around it are impenetrable. But finally, in the 15th century, they're defeated. And the walls are overrun. And now if you go to Istanbul, it is a Muslim city overrun by the Arabs. No nation, empire, country, kingdom lasts forever. He establishes and removes kingdoms. Let me show you that in chapter 2, verse 20. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying... I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy, to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horse and their riders shall go down, everyone by the sword of his brother. So that's God doing that. I like, I like to read at night. Try to read history at night. And so, so two things. Think, think of your mornings and think of your nights. So in the mornings, I want to read the Bible, spend time praying, read the Bible to trust God's sovereignty for the day ahead. At night, I like to read history so I can look back at God's providence and how he's worked through history. So God's sovereignty is me looking through the windshield. I trust he's in control. I look through the windshield. God's providence is me looking behind and seeing what, what God has done. And you gotta have, it's good to have both. Both of them will balance you, will settle, it takes anxiety away, it'll help you with worry. Okay, that's just, that was just a little extra. So the Lord is sovereign. Uh, number four of the outline. I'm trying to go fast because I want us to read the whole thing. I'm going to read the whole book. I mean, it's 38 verses. Number four, when you read this passage and you read... Um, Haggai, you find out we actually are expected to work. We are expected to do something. That, that God has given us the command to take dominion. That when, when, the, when God's people were let go out of exile and sent back to Judah, 
they actually had a command to build the temple. They had to do something to invest in. Why? I'll give you a couple reasons. One is a restored temple glorifies God. A restored temple. I think you can make the argument that principally that a healthy church glorifies God. A restored temple glorifies God. Let me read uh, chapter 1, verse 8. Go up to the hills, bring wood, and build the house. Why? That I may take pleasure in it, and that I might be glorified, says the Lord. Now, I think there are things that, that the people of God can do, even as Christians, what we can do as the church that are honoring to the Lord. I think... Um, I think healthy, robust, doctrinally sound worship honors the Lord. I think unity in a church under the Lordship of Christ is honoring to God. I think seeing people come to Christ is honoring to the Lord. I think uh, reconciliation, like when the gospel, I think spiritual healing, growing, all those things happen inside a really healthy organism called the church. So... We are expected to work toward that, though. A restored temple glorifies God. Let me give you another thing. Uh, the, just in, in the context, the restoration will be a tremendous blessing to all the people. Like, like if, if the temple is restored, it's going to be a blessing to everyone. Chapter 2, verse 19. <clears throat> Is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, after the building, I am going to bless you. It'll be a blessing. Something else that you would pull from Haggai? That is that physical labor is, is urged. Chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, you have physical labor. Chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. Work. I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you, you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Don't be afraid. So that's something just to remind, remind ourselves Practically, one of the really good things you can do is be tired at the end of the day. When I'm talking to young pastors, if they're going to join the staff or they're pastoring a church, uh, one of the, like there are 40 do's and don'ts I have for them, 40 things to do, uh, or do's and don'ts. One of them is walk toward people. The other is always stand in the presence of anybody, old or young. They come down and talk. You stand up. Uh, the other is to keep uh, mints in your left hand pocket so that you're shaking hands and put a mint in your. If you're after your preacher, your breath is going to be real bad. People want to get, get up close, so put a mint in your mouth because it's disgusting. Uh, and there's several things like that, just practical things. Uh, show up early, turn the lights on, all those things. And I do that because there's a certain about God's people, there's something good about working, about doing things. That's why if you run or exercise, there's a sense you get of, of satisfaction. I don't know if it's the endorphins or what it is, but of accomplishment. All of that is, we, we are predisposed to that kind of feeling. God has put that in us. And the physical labor is urged. Something else. Um, all, all that to say, don't get carried away because it's the internal change that's most important. What did Paul say? Physical training is of some value, but godliness has value over all things. That's where the money's made, godliness, you see. Physical training is fine. It's godliness. And the same is true here. Uh, chapter 1, verses 5, 6, and 7. Let me read that to you. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much, you've harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. 
And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. It's not just the work. It's who you are. Let me give you the fifth one. Then we're going to read. Here's my, here's my plan. I'll give you the fifth part of the outline. I want to read the 38 verses and then uh, give you four applications. The fifth is the promised hope. There is a promised hope. Ours is a gospel of hope. So one thing about the gospel is that there is a sense, there's a, there's a sense of being lifted up. There's always, even when you're on the bottom, the gospel lifts up. It's why we can preach what we do. It's why we point people to the grace of God. When you read chapter 2, uh, verse 23, it ends with a, on that day for Zerubbabel. There's a real hopeful ending to the book of Haggai. So let me just walk you through the verses very quickly. Let's just go through it. And then we'll make four applications. Do you want me to that first one? Let's walk through. In the second year of Darius the king, that's 520 B.C., there is a time stamp. In the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai. He is a prophet. Zerubbabel is the government official and uh, Jehozadak, I'm sorry, Joshua is the high priest. Verse 2, and this is the word that comes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. They had been sent there 20 years ago and they're procrastinating. It speaks to procrastination. I am the best procrastinator on things that I don't want to do. Work hard at things I like to do. Uh, but they don't want to do it. So these people have said, the time has not yet come to build the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruin? You're going to spend your time and money and your effort on yourself while God's house is falling apart? That, that's what he's saying. The priorities. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. This is a, that could be a Christian. That's a New Testament statement. You've sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but, it, but no one is warm. He who earns a wage does so to put them into a bag with holes. Anybody want to amen that? Yeah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. If that's going on, you need to think about who you are. Go up to the hills. Here's the command. Go up to the hills, bring wood, build the house, that I might take pleasure in it and that I might be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much. Behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, it blew away. Why? Why can't you get ahead? Declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. You see the, the imbalance in priorities? Therefore, the heavens, above, the heavens above you have withheld the dew. And the earth has withheld its produce. I have called for a drought. This is God controlling the weather. I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine and the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and all their labors. So that's God speaking. Here comes the response. Verse 12, here's the response. <clears throat> It's a government official. Here's some church and state right here. Number two, verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltael, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them, and the people feared the Lord. They needed a strong word. They needed God to speak. I have this young guy that I'm... Uh, Spent a time with his pastor out in, in uh, Stanley County, and he sends me his, uh, his videos of himself, of him preaching. And I'll watch them like, a, like if you ever play football, on, you watch the film, and the, the coach stops, and I'll say, you know, you shouldn't say that, or you look really weird there, or that sort of thing. And uh, so he'll send them to me, and I'll go through and uh, just critique him. 
And the last one is sent. That young man, he is buttoned up. He is preaching with authority. I thought that he hitting the right note and speaking God's word. And evidently, that's what happened with Haggai. And God used that and got a hold of his people. And they actually did something. And they have avoided building a temple for 20 years. Man, that's something. Don't ever lose hope. And someone that has seemed hard-hearted for 20 years, and Haggai preaches, and something happens. Verse 13, Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltael, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, and all the remnant of the people. They worked on the house of the Lord of, Ho of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Time stamp, chapter 2. One month later. Because he said, did all of that. Now we come back to the scene a month later. How do we know it's a month later? Because of verse 1. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, to all the remnant of the people, and say this. Now he's talking to the senior adults. Verse 3 is to senior adults. Who's left among you who saw this house in its former glory? So some of the folks that had been in exile before the first temple was destroyed, they remember the splendor of Solomon's temple. They remember how great. They remember the good old days. It was spectacular. Now they're coming back, and the second temple is nowhere near. And, and Haggai is helping them manage their expectations. See that, what he's doing here? Who's left among you saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it nothing in your eyes? Yet now, be strong. Don't, don't let that get next to you. Don't be disappointed. You need to manage your expectations. It's going to be one of my points. Be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, O you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. You see what he just did? God just spoke and said, I, I'm the exact same God that brought you out of Egypt into the promised land, gave you the Ten Commandments, made that covenant with you, led you all through the kings, through the judges, through Samuel, through David and Solomon, all the kings. Even now, I'm with you. It's the same God. Don't be afraid. My spirit remains with you. Verse 5, according to the covenant I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Don't be afraid. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that treasures of nations shall come in. This is looking forward to this sort of messianic. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place... I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Why would the latter glory be greater than the former? Because Solomon's temple, as glorious as it was, did not have Christ. Christ comes and is greater than anything the Old Testament would point to. The temple didn't do anything but typify, type, typify Christ. Okay, let's bring this home now, starting in verse 10. This is two months later. See the timestamp? On the 24th day on, of the ninth month. Remember, the seventh month. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. Okay, so now let's bring the law in. That's the Old Testament. What is the Levitical law? Ask them about holiness. If someone carries holy meat, in the fold of his garment and touches 
with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? And the priest answered and said, no, not according to the Levitical law. Then Haggai said, okay, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of, those, of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, yes, it does become unclean. So that's the law. Here comes the lesson. Here's the lesson. You have to kind of stay with it. Verse 14, then Haggai answered and said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to wine, the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. I, look, I struck you. I did that, God is saying. I struck you and all the people of your toil with blight and mildew and hail, yet you didn't turn to me. Let me just pause and say, you never know what God is using to turn people. You never know the circumstances. You never know the hard things, the conversation, how something can click. God saves and brings repentance to people in a myriad of ways. God does what He chooses. Now He's working to bring them back. He has sent all of these terrible things to them, and yet they've not turned. Verse 18, Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. Why? They are being obedient. And then there's the, sort of the, the epilogue. Same day. This happens the same day. See the timestamp? The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. Going to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations, overthrow the chariots and their riders, the horses and their riders. They'll go down, every one by the sword of his brother. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I'm going to take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, this is a government official, the son of Shiltael, declares the Lord, and I'm going to make you like a signet ring. What he means is, I'm going to, what you stamp will have my approval. I'm going to use this one layman to do something. I've chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. It's a reminder that God will use people, whether they're high priests, prophets, or, or government workers. Okay, so let me just give you very quickly, very quickly, four applications. Just very quick. Here's the first one. This is from chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. I won't read it again. We need to get our priorities right. Get your priorities right. What is it that is taking precedent? When you list them in your own mind, what are the things at the forefront? Remember what the Lord said, you, you build your own house, but you've neglected. Do we need to flip, flip it over? Get your priorities right. Second uh, application is we need to manage the expectations. I said that a couple of times, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Remember when, when uh, Haggai says, there's some of you here, you remember how great it used to be, and now you're thinking it's not so great. Need to, to make sure that we don't let something that we thought was going to happen and doesn't happen keep us from having joy in the Lord. Here's the third thing. This is from chapter 2, verse 10 to verse 19, that only true repentance counts. That's the only kind of repentance that counts. Repentance that bears fruit. An apology without a change in action 
is just a lie to buy somebody time. Only true repentance counts. And the fourth thing, from chapter 2, verse 20 to 23, chapter 2, verse 20 to 23, in Christ there's always hope for the future. There's always hope for the future. The, the New Testament gospel, the grace of God, the gospel we preach, there's hope for the future. Three extra ones, and I'll be done. Three things matter. Your choices in life matter. Your choices in life matter. We make real choices that have consequences. God's work matters. What God is doing in you individually, in the world, in his church, and your involvement in God's people at the church, that matters. It makes a difference. Number three, staying rightly motivated matters. Being motivated by the right things. Remember, they, when they came out of exile, they went to Jerusalem. They started right to build the temple. They had some hard times, and they quit doing They lost motivation to do that. And staying rightly motivated for the things of the Lord really does matter. All right, 38 verses, two chapters. Small little book of Haggai. Let me say a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for this reminder from your word. Thank you that we have Christ that has given us grace, that has cleansed us of sin, that has purchased us. I pray for healing and hope and joy and strength. Lord, as you've given us in Colossians, I pray for for. Endurance and patience. Endurance to stand under whatever pressure the world has brought. And patience to treat people with kindness and respect. Father, I pray that you wake us up in enough time tomorrow morning to spend time in your word. That you bring us back on Sunday to corporately, as a congregation, worship the risen Lord Jesus. And that you will use us in the meantime for your own glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everyone. You're dismissed.